everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today with guidance on caring for the first calf heifers in your herd. Here's SUNUP's Dave Deacon and our Extension Beef Cattle Specialist, Dr. Dave Lawman. We're kind of in that nutritional period when it comes to cattle between calving, but then also getting ready for rebreeding. Dave, there's, there's some things that, that producers need to be aware of, especially with the first calf heifers. Yeah, the first calf heifer is a challenge because you've spent all this time and investment to get them to a, you know, a cow right. uh, with their first calf, all that development costs and so on, and so you sure don't want them to fall out of the herd at this point. Right. Hopefully you've already challenged them from a nutritional standpoint and you've saved back the ones that were pregnant through your uh, heifer development program. There is quite, there, there is a potential for quite a fall off in nutritional in, in that time. There sure, sure is. The two year old is the most susceptible uh, to marginal or under nutrition, if you will. Uh, and so that, you know, they have a longer postpartum interval than a mature cow. Uh, pregnancy rate generally is considerably lower. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other important part of that picture is the body condition that they calve in. We always say, try to aim for a six in a two-year-old. As you mentioned, the challenge in a fall calving herd is keeping them in good body condition between calving and breeding. What, what do you recommend for producers who, who are kind of in that gray area Right now, they're, they, they got their eyes on Thanksgiving time whenever they can, you know, start breeding back. So for a, a two-year-old that's, let's say, they're starting out with a situation where you're maybe grazing mm -hmm. <clears throat> well-fertilized, either stockpile Bermuda grass or just regrowth from a hay field that might have been harvested in, let's, let's just say, July. Right. Uh, that should be pretty good quality forage if you've had some moisture and, it's, and it represents regrowth. Right. Uh, so in that case, if you've got that kind of forage, you can turn those two-year-olds out on as they calve. Um, six to seven, maybe up to eight pounds of some type of either a commercial feed product or a commodity blend of some type right. that fits in that, say, 12 to 16 percent protein range, mm -hmm. uh, the feed would be 12 to 16 percent protein. Uh, that's really all that's required from a protein standpoint because that regrowth of fertilized Bermuda grass is going to be 10, 11, 12 percent protein. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand you're in a scenario where you're going to turn out on native rangeland or native grass, uh, the six to eight pound range is probably going to be about right for those two-year-olds but now you're gonna to have to have a 20 to 25% protein product. Again, whether it's a commodity blend of some type or whether it's a commercial product. And uh, the same goes if it's got, if you've had some moisture and you've got some summer regrowth, uh, the digestibility of that forage is probably pretty good. The protein is gonna be low. The more picked over it is, um, probably the higher, the closer you are gonna to need to be to the eight pounds feeding rate you know, the better quality it is, you might get by for a while at least in that six pound range. When, when should producers reassess that and kind of make their adjustments as they get closer to November? Okay, so the, the six to eight pound range, you know, you, you kind of need to apply that too. The, the most important thing is to monitor the yep. cattle. And so as they start to slip, that's when you need to make the decision to intervene somehow, change your feeding program, modify it a little bit. You know, we have a really nice software tool called Calculator that these our extension educators are very familiar with and they can use that tool to sit down with a producer and help them through their specific scenario. Thank you very much, Dr. Dave Lawman, beef cattle specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. We're talking with our extension beef cattle specialist, Dr. Rosalind Biggs now. And Rosalind, you actually have a new program that might be some interest for the veterinarians across the state. Absolutely. Uh, we have a new program, which is the Integrated Beef Cattle Program for Veterinarians. Uh, we were very fortunate to receive uh, a grant from USDA National Institute for Food and Agriculture, and it's a collaboration between the College of Vet Med Extension as well as private practice. Our first step in, in the project is really to do some assessment. We know that we have 
underserved areas here in Oklahoma and really across the nation when it comes to uh, rural veterinary needs. And, and we know that here in Oklahoma, uh, the beef industry is uh, one of the leading agricultural industries uh, within Oklahoma and so our focus is, is really there. And uh, trying to create uh, some opportunities, uh, trying to create some education for, uh, for veterinarians and then match them with veterinary students um, with an ultimate goal to have rural practices that are more sustainable, offer wider uh, variety of services to beef cattle producers here in Oklahoma and the surrounding region, and then again network with those current veterinary students to increase mentoring, increase coaching, and put those current veterinary students uh, back in some of those areas that, that were needing more service. Is it specific, is it just all vet, like uh, veterinary practices or is it more large animal or small animal in that area? Well, we certainly see areas that have um, service needs uh, in rural areas across the board in veterinary medicine, regardless of whether that's small animal or, or large animal focused. But the, the, the main purpose is to um, put more put more toys, put more tools in the toolkit of, of current veterinarians in, in rural areas within Oklahoma, um, those underserved areas that we mentioned, mentioned before. Um, we want, you know, we've got a, a really wide variety of expertise on our project team from ag econ to animal science to vet med, and then as we mentioned before, private practice. And we're really wanting all of those mindsets to come together to create some education first and foremost, but also sharing of ideas is critically important as well. And one of the things that this program is needing that you've been working on for the past couple of months is there's a survey to really, you know, get a grasp on what the needs are. Absolutely, you know, we, we recognize we have underserved areas that we, and some may call that a, a rural veterinary shortage, uh, but we really want the data, we really want um, hard numbers and, um, and feedback from veterinarians, from producers, as well as veterinary students on, on what those needs are and uh, what is that, what's that looking like in everyday practice for, for private practitioners. And then we certainly don't want to focus, uh, excuse me, lose focus on our beef cattle producers because we want to know from them, they're the clients, they're the customers of what kind of services are you currently receiving from your veterinarian and what are the other things that you would like to have available to you? And you also have a, a, a webinar as well that, that folks can interact with that's coming up uh, next week. Absolutely, we've, we've had a webinar series on rural veterinary issues and beef sustainability and we in invite folks to, to come take a look at that. Um, the, the critical thing for us is we really need people to, to log in and take that survey for us. We're, we're looking to try to get that survey completed within the next month or so and um, get that information wrapped up so we can start building the curriculum for the program. Alrighty, thanks Rosalind. Right, Dr. Thank Rosalind you. Biggs, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like a link to the survey and the upcoming webinar, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Those Oklahoma cow-calf producers that have fall calving herds are in the beginning, if not the midst of the fall calving season. And for many, it's also uh, when they're putting the, the wheat in the ground for, for next year's wheat crop. So it's a very busy time. One of the chores that uh, we don't want to slip uh, through the cracks is to make sure that the bull battery is ready for the next breeding season. This is a good time to uh, make a visit with your local large animal veterinarian to schedule breeding soundness exams for all the bulls that you're going to use in that fall breeding season. And as the, the veterinarian is doing this uh, breeding soundness exam, I would remind you to visit with he or she about the need for a trichomoniasis test. Trichomoniasis is a reproductive disease of cattle that can be really, really devastating to the next calf crop. And so uh, certainly remind your veterinarian that you want to know about whether your bulls need that trichomoniasis test or not. Also, it might be a good time to have the bull's feet trimmed so that that is done in enough time for those feet to heal up so that he can travel easily when the breeding season begins. 
I'd really like to have that breeding sinus exam done at least 30 days, if not 45 days, before the start of the upcoming breeding season so that any bulls that do fail and really are not going to be serviceable in that breeding season, you've got time to go to a, a local uh, seed stock producer in your area or to a production sale and purchase a replacement bull that you can bring home and get him used to his new environment for several weeks prior to the breeding season. As you do that, I would suggest that you visit with the previous owner about what's the diet of the bull been for the past several months. And if there's been quite a little bit of grain in the diet, this gives you time to gradually step him down to a uh, lower percentage grain in his diet down to nearly none because that's what he's going to have in that breeding season when it goes out on pasture. He might get a, a few range cubes uh, as he's working with the cows, but uh, we certainly want to make that adjustment in his rumen from going from something that's half grain to something that's nearly all roughage long before the breeding season takes place. If we don't, and allow that bull to really change his diet dramatically from a high energy to a high roughage diet at the same time the start of the breeding season, we may see some drop off the fertility of that bull and we certainly don't want that to happen. So I think we want to plan ahead, get that breeding soundness exam scheduled, make sure our bull battery is ready to go at the start of this upcoming breeding season that'll be around Thanksgiving or the 1st of December. And that way we'll have a better, higher quality, higher percentage calf crop next fall. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. If you raise soybeans, you've probably already been out in the field scouting. And, and Tom, what are some of the things that producers need to be scouting for when it comes to insects? Well, if you've planted late soybeans particularly, when they're, they're maybe starting to bloom or they're still in the vegetative stage, uh, what we've seen this year is uh, uh, um, two different caterpillars. They're green caterpillars, so they're hard to tell apart, but if you can just count to three or four, you can tell them apart. And the reason that's important is because the, uh, one of them is a soybean looper, and we've seen some in, in some fields. And uh, if you choose the, the incorrect insecticide for them, they're resistant to some of them. And it's important to be able to tell the difference between soybean looper and green clover worm. Uh, and the difference is counting the number of legs um, on the, the, the hind end of the critter. Green clover worms have three pair plus the anal pro legs. So that's four, and, and the soybean looper has three, uh, uh, two pairs plus the um, anal pro legs. And they both have this kind of looper action, so, and they're green, so it's really hard to tell them apart unless you make that count. Um, and the soybean looper is known to be res uh, resistant to some of the pyrethroid insecticides that are typically used to control worms. Um, it's also important to know what vegetative stage your soybeans are. When they're in flowering and starting to set pods, they're a lot more vulnerable to defoliation than they would be um, if they're just uh, still just growing and haven't started flowering yet. And, and what will those insects actually do to the soybeans? They're, they, they don't feed on the pods. These particular insects are defoliators. They just feed on the foliage. So you'll see a lot of holes and, and that kind of thing uh, as they're feeding. And if you go out and sweep, you can and collect them, but you just, it's important to tell the difference between the two. What, what should producers be thinking about if they're, if they're moving towards a winter crop, say wheat, I mean, army worms, we always worry about those this time of year. Absolutely, and we've, got, we've been uh, testing some traps uh, for a company and we've got traps set out with some of our county educators that have been sending in reports. In fact, Kyle Worthington uh, just sent one in today saying they're starting to catch some. But fall armyworms uh, used to be kind of an uncommon thing to see them in the fall. It's not so uncommon anymore. So. Uh, it's just important to get out and, and, and check the field. Because like you say, it, it, as the wheat emerges, that's when it's the most vulnerable yeah. and then that's whenever they're actually attacking it. Yeah. 
So what, what, what can producers do whenever they reach those thresholds in the field? Uh, there are uh, plenty of insecticides that, um, that work pretty well on, on these, 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 this critter out there. Um, we're going to be looking at a product, it's, a, it's an insect virus called Folagen, uh, I think it's called. Um, I'm going to be working with a farmer and uh, in, in doing kind of a demonstration this year to see how it works. Well, that sounds really interesting. We'll, we'll check back with you on that. All right. And for more information on what we talked about, you can go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Wesley here with your Mesonet weather report. Fall came early to Oklahoma this week as an extremely strong cold front moved through. The chill in the air caused long sleeve shirts and jackets to feel really good. On Wednesday morning, the low temperatures reached to within one degree of freezing in Cimarron County. The cold front broke low temperature records at several different sites in the west, from Eric to Woodward and through the Panhandle. Wind chills are calculated when the temperatures drop below 50 degrees. Looking at the Wednesday morning wind chill map, we see temperatures all the way down into the 20s. The afternoon heating did not accomplish much on Wednesday afternoon in the western two-thirds of the state. This map from mid-afternoon shows maximum temperatures only reached into the 30s and 40s out west. Looking at the record least maximum temperatures for September the 9th, it is likely that records were not only broke but shattered from a line between Osage to Love County and all points westward. If you're wondering, the normal average high temperature for the state on that day would have been 87 degrees. While the extremely cool temperatures tended to moderate relatively quickly, it is likely that we will remain at least below normal next week, as well as indicated by the blue colors in this forecast map. Gary is up next with the rain impacts to the latest drought maps. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well, we finally got some decent range across western Oklahoma. Hopefully it'll help out that drought monitor map. Maybe not this week's map, but definitely next week's. At any rate, let's take a look at that new drought monitor map and see what we have. Well, we still see the same basic picture with drought across the western third of Oklahoma, especially in the southwestern and west central parts of the state, up into the western panhandle. Also a little bit in the eastern panhandle as well. And just a tiny bit of dry conditions and uh, drought up in the far northeastern parts of the state. All other areas of the state are perfectly clear, and that's certainly great news. Let's take a look at some of those rains we received this week. A great area of rain across west central and southwest Oklahoma. Hopefully that's filled out some since then. Also out in the central panhandle and up into northeastern and north central Oklahoma. Decent rains up in that area. And we go out over the next, uh, or the past 30 days, we see those good rains across the eastern parts of the state, at least as we get into east central and southeast Oklahoma. And then also some great rains down in uh, south central up into central Oklahoma and even some decent looking rains out in parts of southwest Oklahoma with the addition of this week's rain. But I mean, everybody's had some rain, but some areas definitely need some more. So we did have uh, pretty good rains across western Oklahoma uh, this time around. Hopefully we'll have a much better map uh, as we go into next week with the drought monitor. I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen and I can't wait to show it to you. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. Kim, growers are harvesting their summer crops. They're starting to plant fall wheat. What kind of decision-making process do you recommend as they try to decide what crops to actually plant? Well, right now, many producers are putting the pencil to determine which crop to plant over the next year or maybe over the next five years. And the one piece of information they've got to have is the price over the next five years. Now, I've made those estimates, and if you look at wheat, it's about $4.75, corn, $3.60, grain sorghum, $3.35, cotton, $0.65, cents, soybeans, $8.60, and sesame, $0.35. Cents. How did you come up with these projections? Well, I used uh, the University of Missouri, the Food Network, the Food and Agriculture Products Research Institute and the USDA's estimates. So I had two estimates of these prices over the next five years. 
I averaged them out to come up with a single estimate, and then I looked at uh, how Oklahoma prices compared to them. Uh, you look at uh, wheat, I used uh, an even price because the average Oklahoma June, July price compared to the average U.S. price in that time period is equal. On uh, corn, the Oklahoma price is about 18 cents above the average U.S. price. Sorghum price is 25 cents below corn. Soybean prices are about 22 cents in Oklahoma below the U.S. average price. On um, cotton, I use the ICE futures price out in the, and it comes in about three cents less than that futures contract price. And canola is a contract price that you can contract for production in future years. Which crop then shows the highest odds for producing a profit? Trent Malachek at Enid, he's our area economist, uh, built a budget for each one of these crop enterprises and they all come in pretty tight because prices are relatively low. So what he says is depends on your machinery complement and your management abilities and your soil conditions and where you're located in the state. And so what that means is that each producer needs for each farm budget out each of these alternatives and determine what the odds are that he's going to get a profit on each one and choose the best one. Great analysis, Kim. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Late summer into early fall is when we can expect to find velvet ants. Velvet ants are large, hairy, ant-like insects that are actually wasps that belong to one family. We can see them commonly uh, occurring in lawns and pastures this time of year. Velvet ants display a warning coloration, uh, usually reds, yellows, and blacks, as a warning to potential predators that they are dangerous. But while not aggressive, uh, the females do pack a powerful punch uh, with their sting. Uh, they have a very powerful venom uh, and, a, and a long uh, stinger uh, that they conceal at the tip of their abdomen. One of our largest species, the cow killer, has such a potent venom that it's said to be able to kill cows, although this claim is doubtful. The species of velvet ant that we call the cow killer measures nearly an inch long, is red, and has black markings. They're commonly seen or more, more readily observed just due to their sheer size and uh, their speed as they move along the ground. Velvet ants display sexual dimorphism, which means that the males and females do not resemble one another. Uh, the males are winged and look more like wasps, whereas the females do not have wings and have that ant-like appearance. They have a very velvety, hairy body. Velvet ants can commonly be seen in bare patches of soil like we see behind me. Uh, this is because their preferred prey, uh, ground nesting bees and wasps, tend to occur in these areas. Uh, the female velvet ant will enter the chamber of those ground nesting uh, bees and wasps and lay their eggs on the brood. And those eggs then hatch into the larval velvet ants that feed as external parasites uh, on those uh, developing bees and wasps. Because these can be considered nuisance pests due to their sting, and if they're occurring in large numbers in an area, one way to manage that problem is to try to reduce their abundance by overseeding with grasses in those areas of bare soil where their preferred food sources, those ground nesting ants, ground nesting bees and wasps occur. So while one particular species of velvet ant is called the cow killer, uh, this is nothing to be concerned about from an agricultural standpoint. These are not pests of agriculture. A lot of producers are thinking about hay production. And if you're used to cutting uh, introduced grasses like Bermuda grass, you're probably making multiple cuttings per year. 
Um, these fields often have high inputs and produce lots of biomass. But if you're also cutting native hay pastures, you need to treat them differently. First of all, they should only be cut once per year. And also, when you cut them, make sure you leave at least four inches of stubble height. And this will ensure that those grasses um, are, are vigorous and, and that you don't, over time, cr create a situation where you have more unfavorable grasses in that field because multiple hay cuttings can have long-term negative impacts on that grass community if it's a native grass field. And the timing of when you cut is something else that's very important. Uh, a lot of people are generally start thinking about cutting in, in mid-June but if you wait till early July, you can optimize not only the forage quality, but also the quantity. So we recommend that you try to shoot for that early first uh, week of July period to do your hay cutting on native grass fields. And this has an added benefit to wildlife that might be using that field. Because if you'll delay until early July, a lot of ground nesting birds have already hatched. Uh, deer fawns are up large enough that they can escape. And so you're going to have a lot less negative impacts on wildlife that might be also using those native grasses. And also think about how you cut the field. Knowing that these native grass fields often have lots of wildlife, birds, deer, uh, rabbits, it's a good idea to either start cutting on one side of the field and work your way across or start cutting in the middle and work your way out. Do this rather than ringing the field and working your way in which often will trap wildlife and they'll wait until the last minute to flee and you might hit them with your hay equipment. So think about timing, uh, the way you cut the field, and also only cutting once per year when we're talking about native hay production. Thanks so much for joining us this week for SUNUP. Remember you can find us anytime on our website and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week everyone and remember Oklahoma agriculture starts at SUNUP.